Red Scare Entertainment takes pleasure in presenting Goverda Darano, a journey into the phantasmagoric lands of folklore, literature, theater, and film. In the centuries-old tradition of the Romane people, we bring to you stories of superstition, fantasy, and adventure. There's no turning back. The Verda approaches. Good evening, friend. I am Asmakawai. Today's world moves so quickly. From technology to trends, it's hard to catch your breath, no? Even our beliefs are pressured under the march of progress. What once was fact can now be proven fiction. A mere fairy tale. A nightmare. It's strange to think that there was a time when creatures from worlds beyond our flesh ran amok in our villages and homes. Could you suspect to find a specter hunting a skyscraper today? Our company on this journey, Phyllis, believes so. Why? She and those she knew dearly were first-hand witnesses to the fiends that time was lucky to forget. Do they still exist? Hiding in the shadows of our everyday lives? Come. There's only one way to find out. Lachirachi Dead Scare Entertainment. Welcome back to another chilling episode of Overda Darano. Today we have with us another extremely special guest. We have with us today Phyllis Richko Greeny from Las Vegas. And we are so glad to have you on the podcast. How are you doing today? I am doing fantastic. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. That's wonderful to hear. So with that being said, let's not waste any time. Let's get into this. So I always like to tell everybody to let's start at the beginning. So when I say start at the beginning, uh, what was it like growing up Rom? What were the positives, the negatives? Give, give our listeners a mental picture of what it was like growing up as a Rom. Well, some of the Roma had a little more money and some didn't have as much. But being a Rom, everybody helped each other. And that was the best part of it. We all stuck by each other. No gadget could mess with us because we would all stick together. And we lived on Burling Street. And almost every house was owned by a gypsy or rented. My grandfather, Greeny, owned many homes on Burling and Orchard and Vine and North Avenue. And had a lot of Roma living in his apartments. Going to school, we all would walk bunches of us. We'd meet and we'd all go to school, 10, 12 of the girls. We'd go. And uh, they didn't have lunch rooms in at that time. So we would get to go out for lunch. Well, they did have it when, when we were young. But when we went to uh, like uh, Upper Great Center, we had to go out. So we'd go on this, uh, it was called Johnny's Beef Sandwiches. And we would all go eat hot dogs, beef, sausages, fries. It was, we would talk. It was great. Then my Uncle Bobby Greeny would come with the white Cadillac, my papoos. And we'd he'd say, hey, you just want to ditch school? We'd all go on. We did school. We'd go on to museums and the parks and everything. But we didn't do it too much. Yeah. But pretty much we did go to school. We we did want an education, actually, you know, but at that time, a lot of people didn't have money. And I was already going to first year high. And that's when that uh, breakout came with Martin Luther King. There was a big rioting squad on and uh, we had martial law, which we had to be in the house by six o'clock. And uh, 
lot of the, the lot of my girls were, were beautiful, and uh, the gudge were, were beating up on us and the gullet. So most of us quit school at an early age. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's sad because it would have it would been great to have a good education. Luckily, I went to eighth grade only, but uh, I could say that I feel I was educated. I was a manager in many places here. I worked in Caesars in a forum shop as a manager. Sunglass at Sunshade. I uh, opened up Arizona Charlie's Buffet on the east side being a manager. So I was fortunate in that part because on-the-job training was great for me, you know. Yeah. And we had water fights. Shanko would put up a big screen outside or watch all the movies. You know, they had them on the reels then. And everybody would sit outside. I'm talking 50, 60 of us, and we'd watch the movies, and we'd drink did they bring food outside and it it was they'll never have that but we had the Roma today would never have I'll tell you that mm, that's something. and this was all in Chicago right yes it was so did you live all of your life in Chicago were you living in other places well I lived in Chicago most of my life <laughs> Then I left and when I went to Detroit for five years, I lived in Detroit. And then I came back to here, to Vegas, and I am with a gajo now, who is learning a lot of my ways, trying to be a gypsy, you know, because mm-hmm. he said these, your ways are so great. You know, everybody comes in the house, but you just want to eat, come on, sit down, you call I cook on a Sunday, breaded chicken stuff, cabbage, halushki, whatever. My brother, Karen, Carrington, all the family come. And and that's something that we love. We love to be with our family. We love to hear music is our life. You know, it's, it's I love music. Why I'm cleaning, I got the music on. I'm in the shower. I got us in the radio in the bathroom. I have to hear the music, you know. And my kids are the same way. My son's working in a garage with music. My daughter, forget it. Her house is blasting with music, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had a lot of respect. We didn't swear our parents, nothing. Anything they told us to do, we did. We listened. So it, it was a different upbringing as today, you know. Very true. We weren't allowed to go with other nationalities to get married to Gaja. You know, we had to stick within our own. But you brought up something that a lot of the Roma, surprisingly, didn't really bring too much up uh, about during these podcasts. Um, you mentioned how important music is to our people. What was it like growing up with so many talented Romana musicians around? What was what were parties like and how were things, how was life like around constant music? Well, let me explain something to you. First of all, when I got married, I was 17. We had such a big hall and there was three, three different rooms. One room, all the Roma men were playing the old music and that age was in there. Then we had another room where it was a little faster music and then we had another room for the younger, that kind of music, different. It was fantastic. For the funerals, they played oh, like a symphony. That's how they played, how many there was. And what they would do, they would all march with the funeral car through all the streets past the person who died, their house. And they would all be playing the music. The big basses, the young kids would hold the bass up with one hand and the men were playing the basses, the violins, the guitars. It was unbelievable. Unbelievable. On the weddings, on the things, the Roma, my Baba Emma Tubo, she was a great singer, Corey, Fanny, um, What's her name? Uh, Sawarka. All of them. They would sing beautiful. It was it was it was too great. It was too great. I would give anything to go back in time. I'm serious. That's how beautiful it was. Wow. And you're speaking just on particular in particular just events like bigger like family events like life events. Was this a, was the music the same way like during every day? Was there constantly because I, well, I mean. 
Anastas and Anna, my father, he worked a day job. Now this is talking about me, my family, right? Mm-hmm. And my papa and my mother's in the house. Well, I was six years old, and they put me on a cocktail table, and they put Dakota State in them. And they tell me, now listen to her. Now I want you to copy how she sings. And they was learning us how to sing from then. How to tenor, how to sing, what was jazz, by who was the greatest voices. And, you know, it, but there was always music in our house. My uncle Norman would come, Norman King, everybody knew him, every gypsy knew him. My father would play the bass, lefty, my, they would play the piano, Albert Harvard would come in the house. They would play, and it it would be an ordinary day. It was just great. My father made benches outside our house with hold about five, six of the people. And uh, kids and grown-ups, they'd sit out there, they'd talk. It was too great. Friday and Saturday at my mother and father's house, my dad would go because he was also a musician to play. And they'd have card days, card nights, every Friday and Saturday at my house. And I'm talking, there was a lot of people that I can remember. There was uh, Rosie Piroshka, Sita, Vernie, Loretta, my mother, Joan, Rustachka. Uh, many, many of the women would be there till 2, 3 in the morning. My father would come home from play, they would still be playing. It, it, it was different times, different times. That's something. So with that type of picture in mind, because what you just painted was uh, was like, in some ways, I just saw like the Norman Rockwell version of the Roma, essentially. It was, it was a beautiful picture. Um, so obviously, whenever there be parties, whatever the party may be, the Roma probably had a dynamite time. So I'm guessing during <laughs> Halloween time, you know, during the fall, but especially during Halloween, you guys probably had wonderful parties. What was what was Halloween like for the Roma growing up? A lot of times Shanko would have it in his basement, a Halloween party, or Bapka would have it in her bar. And uh, the kids would all go trick-or-treating. we go all on our streets by the Roma. Our family, it was mostly every every house was Roma. They didn't want us to go by gadget ticket kids. We would all dress up, and you know, some would have homemade costumes. Some would buy those plastic in those days, you know, the masks yeah. and the hard masks and all that. And then when we'd come home, we'd go. Our parents would put us to sleep. Of course, our babas would watch us or someone. We never were left alone. And they would all get dressed up. And they would go and they would have glasses, parties. I remember my Uncle Junior dressed like a pregnant woman with the babushka, the big stomach. And uh, <laughs> the pirates. Uh, and Oh, it was just unbelievable. Unbelievable. And uh, also... I'd like to mention our Easter's were fabulous. We'd have big, big parties in our crowd. We'd go in somebody's house, and I'm talking big parties. Every girl had a hat on and gloves and a purse, and every boy would wear a hat. Like the hats, they wear the fedoras today. Well, that's what the boys would wear then, with suits, and they had top coats on. And we were all dressed up, and we'd go in Bubka's Tavern to show off, you know, who's dress, dress, who's beautiful. Everybody looked beautiful, but that's what we would do, you know? Of course. And we, there were tables where the kids could sit down, and they'd give us Cokes and stuff like that, and our parents were drinking, having a good time, and we all the kids were sitting by the table watching them, you know? So if you had to remember going back, because I know Easter, Easter, Christmas, uh, all these holidays throughout the, the year are so big with the Roma because, I, I mean, it's let's just face it, the Roma love an excuse to have a good time. Well, but, as for Christmas, yeah. as you know, it's our thing that uh, 
they would come around. They, the men would go Christmas caroling. They would knock on our doors. They would all be playing for us. And we, they'd give them, our parents would give them money, you know, and they'd wish us sasip and ten bucks. That means luck, happiness in your house always, you know. And uh, that was great. And for New Year's, no man could come in the house. Twelve o'clock, first guy got a man got to come through that door. And he got to wish you luck, happiness, help, sasip and buck. You know, then the woman could come in. Yeah. We still do that today, too. We still exactly. do that. Exactly. Every, yeah, every uh, New Year's, and every Christmas. Wash. My papu greenie, everybody knows they always had money. When they came from Europe, they came with crates. They had uh, trunks full of money. And uh, we would put silver. He made us, until today, I still do this. My children do it also, because I taught them that. You put all silver coins in a bowl. And when 12 o'clock comes, you wash yourself, your hand, your face with that silver. And if you're out, you put the silver on your pocket, you put it in your hands and you wipe through all your hands with the silver. And that's supposed to be that you're never broke. And thank God it works for us, <laughs> you know. I mean, you know, not that we're made out, but we, we, we got enough to live and support and enjoy our life. There you go. That's what it's about. And I mean, mm -hmm. and see, this is what it is, is there's so many traditions among the Romani people that um, are either that a lot of people don't know about, a lot of the Roma don't know about, or they completely just died off. And um, yeah, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because even and like, like for, for like uh, for Easter, when we bless our baskets, a lot of Roma don't know how to do a lot. Even when I went to Detroit, I had to make like everybody. Like I had 15 of these sequels bowls I had to make for everybody, you know? So what's 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 the sequels? Sequels no. is from Europe. It's from, and my baba and them are from Braddock, and it's a cheese ball. It's made with eggs, milk, vanilla, and sugar, and you could put pineapples, cherry, whatever. I make it every year, even for my my brother. I have to make one because Karen don't make it. My sister makes it. My my daughter knows how to make it, and that you put it in the basket. You have to have that. That's for luck. That we should always have food in our house. Hmm. See, I'm glad I asked that because a lot of Roma, I mean, don't. A lot of times, it's there. And a lot of Roma, especially my generation, they're not the type to ask questions. They just do as they're told, but they don't know why we do certain things. So I'm glad you right. mentioned that. I'm glad you mentioned that. So, one thing we're gonna go, we're gonna backtrack a little bit. Instead of hanging out in springtime, we're gonna head back to fall. Did you have a favorite costume or did, was there something that you dressed up as when you were, that you really stuck with you? Well, I've gone costume parties and usually I won first prize. <laughs> I gotta say, <laughs> I'll just mention two costumes. And it was, um, my ex-husband Jimmy got to which we were still friends. We were she, he owned the bar, they owned the bar. All the good people went for uh Halloween, you know, they had a party, best dress. Well I was a geista. So I dressed what, as a geisna. So for those who don't speak Romanes, what's a geisna? A dresser. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what it is, it was those cardboard, but it was a long one. Right, so I took all the drawers out and I made the hole on the top, the hole on the sides, and I put my head to the top. You understand how I'm saying now? Yeah. Okay. Then we glued the drawers back in. But before I glue my, I put pantyhose hanging out, a bra, a bloomer, <laughs> a little bit out of the drawer. <clears throat> and... It was like a flower, like a text on my hands. I had like the color of it on. In, on my head, I made out of a cardboard, but we stapled it together. It was like a psychedelic vase where you couldn't see my eyes. 
you understand? My eyes were in there, but their face was all different colors, so you couldn't see my eyes in my mouth. And I had a styrofoam, because it was real tall to face, tied to my head in a bow, and I stuck all big flowers out. <laughs> and I won first prize. Wow. That was a lot of money, $500 back then. That's you know? Something. And then once I was a Christmas tree. I went and I bought all this green crinoline, and I went to Savi Shop, which is a Goodwill store. And I bought a hoop from a from a dress from a, someone who marched. And I cut it all out like a Christmas tree, the, you know, the crinoline. And I made it in layers, and I had lights, bulbs. I had stars on my face to light up earrings. I had the star in my hair. I won five hundred dollars for that price but that was in a bar we went at the gudja bar yeah and everybody dressed up oh my god oh everybody looked great everybody was something you know they were one year we were all flapper girls when that fringe dress came out the flapper style we all had all those all different colors we were dressed and uh, the boys would dress It, it, it was like the boys in them days, too, on our good times, they would always pull us to dance. We always dance. Now the boys, they don't dance. The girls got to dance all with the girls, and the boys are just dancing and drinking and doing whatever, you know? Mm-hmm. Very few dance. It, it's, it's, it should be where they should look forward to the party to have a good time. Pick the girls. Come on, let's dance. Come on, pull. Everybody to be together like it was before. Well, the boys think they're too cool nowadays. Well, they have drugs in their mind. That's their mm-hmm. problem. Yeah. Most of them want to get high, you know? And uh, it's more important than being with the woman or the girl, whatever. Sorry to say that, but, you know, they're interested in that. Or, you know, just that some of them are ashamed to dance. But I wish they would get back into that. Yeah, there's a lot of things that I wish that the Romania people in general would get back into. And it's just, I... I, I just hope that hopefully with us discussing these things that eventually maybe this will put give everybody a kick in the pants to realize yeah. that maybe they should get back in the swing of things. Did you have a favorite scary movie growing up or were there movies that you really enjoyed or that scared you the most? Like what kind of spooky movies hit you? The well, most? if you're talking about spooky movies, okay. I was dead scared of the exorcist. I wouldn't even go on the toilet. I couldn't <laughs> stand by this door because I'm not going in the toilet. You gotta stand outside where I went to be. I was dead scared. We lived in the attic. And he was then he was making the bed shake like that. I said, "Yay!" I was screaming. He was you know, scaring me, and I was scared of the Amityville Horror. That scared me a lot. And there was another one called Phantasm that I can't even hear the music. My kids don't ball bones. I thought about do it. I was dead scared of those pictures. That's those so were nice. my three scariest pictures. And I think when The Exorcist came out, a lot of people were scared. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt. That's so far. um, Everybody that we've talked, well, mostly everybody that we've talked to has always mentioned that they when they went to go see in the show, uh, just how much or they watched it on television, how much it completely like terrified them. Yeah. How it was. It's just it's one of those movies that it's true. You I will say if you're if you like getting scared, that is one place that you'll get scared for sure. But then I'd I say stay away from the Luigi boards. <laughs> oh yeah, no, that's, that's for how sure. I started. 
Yeah, you know? that's I will say that that's the one thing that a lot of and it's it's funny because you hear you watch these movies and the one thing everybody says, don't mess with this. If you don't know what you're doing, don't mess with this. You're, don't and, mess with evil, anything evil. Exactly. If you just be with God and you pray and you, everybody makes mistakes. Hey, we're human. He knows that. But the best three letter word in life is to just try. Try to be better. Try to be closer to God. And try and love are the best words I can think of. Very true. Very, very true. It's that's what makes that's what I think makes that movie so so important for Romo to actually watch because it makes you it gives you a better perspective essentially of what actually can happen the fact that this is why we should be a little bit more cognizant about what we do and you know how how we live our lives because things exist things exist oh you ain't kidding you know let me tell you the devil was an angel before he was a devil right mm-hmm. and he was angel of light, the most beautiful but he went against the Lord on, he was cast from heaven, he was thrown into hell, so there's no more powerful post person in the world than God That that's the world to go so if we were scared of the movie back again, yes, everybody was scared, but we knew there was a God so we'd say, oh God, don't let this happen to us, don't let them, not an evil come by us sign the cross, you know what I mean? Of course. Because we were scared. Of course. Let's go even back a little bit more, a little bit more into the past. Um, did you, one thing that we love to talk about and kind of is our, is our bread and butter here at Dead Scare Entertainment is the classic universal monsters. So we're talking Dracula, Frankenstein, Wolfman, Mummy, um, like those particular films. Do you remember uh, watching any of those growing up or did you? Did you? Well, sure, I did. We watched the Wolfman. We watched the Mummy. Several Draculas. Um uh, it was, I can't really think of the Pacific name, but it was a more moderner, a Dracula. Oh, Christopher and, Lee. Uh, I think it was the best film that was made of him, you know. Okay. Uh, they're very, very good movies. Got you. So, okay, you actually brought up a very interesting question because a lot of people, that's the one of the biggest debates in like the in the horror scene who's the better dracula bella lugosi or christopher lee so i'm guessing it sounds to me like you uh you're you're heading more towards christopher lee or am i wrong i think he was yep wow bella lugosi was in the older one christopher the other one was in the younger one of the the, the movie of the Dracula, right? Yeah. So that had to be the one. And the one that I... Do you know a name of the movies? Yeah, I do know these. I know the majority of these movies, yeah. Could you tell me a couple of them? I might, then I'll know. There was um, Dracula, Prince of Darkness. There was one that was called Count Dracula. There was the Blood of Dracula, if I'm not mistaken. There was Dracula, uh, A.D. 1972. There was a bunch of... Christopher Lee made a lot. He made a lot of, of Dracula films. So we have The Brides of Dracula. There was um, The Satanic Rites of Dracula from 73. Then there was one that was just plain and simple called Count Dracula. That was from 1970. Dracula, A.D. 1972. Then there was The Taste, Taste of Blood of Dracula from 1970. Scars of Dracula from... Wow, he they, did a lot. He did well, so many. I'm I'm surprised how many. Then was, there were. Was there new, ones or newer than that? Um, there might. Maybe you're thinking of Frank Langella then. Uh, maybe, maybe that. that one came out in the '70s, and that was um, 
Yeah, Frank Langella did one. And then there was also the one with Gary Oldman, uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula that came out in... That was a good one. That was a very good one. That was all, gosh. What was the one with the, the other one you were talking about? With Christopher Lee. There was multiple. That's why it's... Uh, Frank Langella was just called Dracula. He was great, too. He was very good. Wow. Well, I'm surprised. I will say this is a first. This is a first for me because the people that I've talked to so far, everybody when they when they talk about vampire films when they talk about Dracula, their number one is Bela, and I, I'm surprised. I'm I'm glad to see that there's somebody thinking a little bit differently. But oh, because he was the older one. It was older. I mean, some of his first, I don't even know if there was talking in some of his, but there was. I know in time there was a lot of black and white, but uh, this one Dracula, this one movie particularly, I don't know the name of it, my husband died on horse, you know, but maybe it was with that Langella guy or whatever his name was, uh, but it, it scared me. It was more like up to date, more modern, the movie. Hmm. Do you remember any parts of it? In particular, because maybe I could I could pinpoint it Just from that. Just like you know, when the when the floors were that brick, you know, the small bricks, and he was running after the people, and they were oh, just Pacific. But every Dracula is mainly almost the same, but the mirrors and the you know and all that stuff. But uh, he was after this woman. He got her. He, you know, he bit her. And uh, she became like the Dracula too. Then, hmm. I'll have to look into that. Maybe I'll be able to remember what it is. Yeah, I wish I could. Read it. I thought I thought the name started somehow. A V is coming in my mind. A V, the letter V. Um, it was the Count. Maybe Count Dracula. The Count. Something with a V. I don't know. Hmm. Like I'll, if anything, I'll I'll probably be able to remember this. I'll have to like watch these. Yeah, I'll watch them all again real quick, and then, <laughs> then I'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I you're fine. Remember. No worries. Believe me, my memory's been uh, with. The, there's so many of them. You're you brought up a valid point. A lot of these movies have the same plot line. They do have the oh. same plot line, but um. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of people, what they call that is the now the, his films come from what they call uh, the Hammer Horror uh, film uh, collection. Essentially, They're the ha Hammer Horror films were the sort of like the competition to the Universal Horror films because Universal started it all, but then Hammer came in and made them even more scarier, and they were in color, so it really was something that stuck yeah. with people. But I believe the movie was in color. It, yeah. I, yeah, all of Christopher Lee's Draculas were in color. They were. So And he was good looking, the Dracula, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, they picked Christopher Lee's a very handsome man. He is. And yeah. almost every role he played, he was, yeah, he was always, he was always and kept himself very well, even in his old age. He still was acting even in his... I, I forgot what, I think he was 92. I could be wrong oh. when he passed away, but he kept himself very well. What's shaking, OVD fans? This is Pierce Horvath, co-founder of Dead Scared Entertainment. Raquel and I are so glad to have you listening to each and every episode of Overda Darano and would greatly appreciate it if you'd give us a five-star rating and leave a positive review on whatever platform you tune in from. This will help us reach more fantastic fans just like you and make the shadows just that much more friendly. We put a lot of effort into this and all our content, including drawing videos, true paranormal experiences, and even more is all accessible at deadscaredentertainment.com. And if you'd like to reach us through the ether and contact us regarding content ideas, general questions, or just to say hello from the other side, slither or swoop your way over to the contact us page on deadscaredentertainment.com. Thank you for listening. And now, back to your favorite bone-chilling broadcast, O Verda Darano. Speaking of which, with all these movies, like, you know, with vampires and werewolves and ghosts and things, do you believe in things like that? Of course. Of course. Okay, so 
Um, Definitely. I believe in aliens. I was just going to ask you about aliens. So let's let's start with the aliens, because not a lot of people talk about their experience with aliens. Have you had an experience with the extraterrestrial? Well, not face to face did I ever seen one. But me and my husband, where we lived, we had a balcony and, you know, he was he was blind, Ricky. Mm-hmm. He'd see very little. So I he wanted a telescope. And I bought him this very expensive, you know, on the lakes it was. So he he loved to look at the moon, the stars, and all that. Well, he said, Phyllis, come here, hurry up. So I said, what? He said, look in this telescope. Well, he was looking in the night. Well, I looked. There was two separate circles, round circles, and it was like electrifying little blue lights around them. Right. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't moving or anything. They were just still standing there still. Now I'm watching it for a while, you know, and boom, they disappeared out of the blue. They just boom. They, I didn't see them move. I didn't see them fly. I didn't see them go up, down, nothing. They just disappeared. Well, you tell me that you can't believe in aliens. What was that? It wasn't a plane. What was it? And how many people see them? And had you know, we live in Las Vegas. We can. We've been talking. My husband and I. He wants because he's into the aliens to go to the Area Fifty One. I said you can't. You get just close enough to it. There's actually signs. If you come any further, you will be shot. They will shoot you to death. We've seen it. And you know what? It was even closer because we had the telescope. You know what I mean? We were looking through the telescope. So you tell me that it was there and it just went away? How? This is something. something. It's true. So. And how could all these. What do you think all these computers and everything? I believe they're in our house. They see us in the TV and everything. They got they, they, they invented these computers, these cell phones. I believe in other planets. I believe that there's other people living in other planets. That's true. Maybe I'm crazy, but that's just, you know. Do you believe in reincarnation? In some ways, I've heard people say that they've had animals that have uh, that visit them mm-hmm. they've i've heard people that actually have talked that they've had young children in their families reincarnated um from past loved ones i've I, so in some ways i don't i don't discount it i just i've yet to experience it firsthand i right. i believe it's a possibility well listen did you ever get the feeling you go somewhere you know i know i was here I yes this. i was here you get it so strong, right? Of course. But you can't recall because they say that when you get that, that that was in another life you were there. Hmm. But we don't know for you know. I don't like you're saying. I don't know for sure, but I'm spectacle of it. You know. I'm like hmm. Like in my life, I really actually feel this. Because how would I do this? I feel I was a big doctor, a big surgeon. And I was also a big criminal attorney. I know I sound stupid, but this is this is how I feel. And like I told you, I was born with all my teeth in the mail. So my husband, he was blind. He fell down the stairs. He ripped his toe, but... Not how you think the mess was coming out. I told him, hurry up, we got to go in the hospital. You need surgery, you got to have stitches, money. Well, he was the type, he said, no, I'm not done going, I'm not doing nothing, you could fix it. You got to do it. You give me the stitches. Well, with a couple of tools that I did have in my house for nails, I pushed the meat and hold it with one. And I had this big round needle. I sewed his toe, but maybe about 15 stitches. How did I do these things? First, I sterilized the needle. I did all that. I, you know what I mean? It's just things. And then, like, 
So many cases, like my sister bought furniture, they didn't want to take it back. She called the lawyer, everything, blah, blah, blah. She said, call them. I called them, and two days she had her money back. They took the furniture and other things, you know, just like so many things that I handled, and and I got what I wanted. So I got this, I have a lot, I got this really, really feeling. Even this God you I'm married to. He says, if I can't settle something, I'm calling you because you. I know you can settle it. <laughs> it's weird. That's but, something. But, and, and, you know, it's so it makes you think. True. But you mentioned something earlier because um, we talked about this before, uh, but our podcast listeners didn't have a chance to hear this. You mentioned that you were born with all of your teeth and you had a great story about what that what that was and what it was like. Could you give us a, could you tell us that story? Sure. Well, when I was born, I had all my front teeth and, the do- and I had like a piece of skin, which they called a veil. And they gave the skin to my mother and they said it's XL. Very few people have this, you know. Well, my great grandmother, Yajich Kanya, said, We got to tell all the Roma. We have to tell all the Roma because she'll be a Veshos. A Veshos is someone that can tell the future what's going to happen. Excuse me. And they didn't want that. That I should know when somebody dies, when somebody's sick, you know. So they told everybody. And, uh, they had to be very careful feeding me because I was biting the nipple. You know, you could choke when you're swallowing the mouth. So they went, they told all the Roma, they were telling everybody, people came in the house, they seen it. Well, within three days, my teeth disappeared. My mother got up in the morning to feed me, the teeth are gone. So she was so, they were scared. They thought I was choking. They up, you know, I was up and they, I was fine. They looked in a, crib and everything, nothing to be found. It just disappeared. So there are times when I get this feeling and if I get it really in the middle of my chest or stomach and I say, Doug, I got to go, I got to gamble, I'm going to win, or I got to do this because this is going to happen, I got to be there or something, believe me, 100% of the time it's true. I'm not going to say 99, I'm going to say I'm going to go with 100 when I get this feeling. So wow. they still say it's with me. It stays with me, you know, I, I would say 99%. It stays with me, but like, I could give you a couple incidents if you want to hear them. Sure. Okay. I was working in Caesar's Palace in the jewelry store. So these two women come in, they were sisters, and they were looking at jewelry. And she said, well, can I see this? And I put them there, I showed her, you know, it was expensive, it was more money. And I says, you know, I don't know if you really want this piece. She said, well, it's beautiful, why would you say? I said, well, it is beautiful and it is expensive, but I'd like to show you something else that I think that you are really gonna love. And the person that you're giving it to is gonna love. So I take her on the other side, and it's Zuni, which is much cheaper. She was looking at David Rosales. It's Indian jewelry, by the way. Mm -hmm. So I go underneath, (laughs) and back stuff, I put my black velvet pad on the counter, and I pull out this small opal cross. And the woman said, oh, my God. Oh, my God. She was, like, passing out, like, meddling, you know? The, the sister was, like, holding her. Yeah. And she said, how did you know? How did you know that this is what I wanted, that what I was looking for? And how do you know who it's for, what it's for? Could you please tell me? I said, I, I got scared of myself. I didn't want to tell her because I said, well, if I say something, what if it's the wrong thing? She'll tell me she'll get mad. I could get fired. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But the feeling in me was so very strong. I said, I don't want to get in trouble or anything. I says, she says, I won't say anything. Just tell me, please, what you're feeling. I said, okay. I said, first of all, your name is Natalie. She said, oh, my God. Oh, my God. What are you, ma'am? Tell me. 
are, are you a, a, a psychic or what? Because her name was Natalie. I don't know how I did, knew it. It just it came out of me, okay? The biggest part, I told her, this is for your daughter. She looked at me, but she was really Paris crying. It, the, the, her face was red, okay, and the sister. She said, yeah, it is for her, and it's for my daughter. She said, well, do you know why? I said, yeah, we want to put it on her in a casket. Sure. She, I, she died. The daughter died. Her daughter. I said, you want her to wear it? Well, she was sick to her stomach. She bought it. But she took my name, my address. They were sending me Christmas gifts, everything. Everything was true. That I told her, never seen the woman. No, never knew her. It just came from me. Obviously, it sounds to me that you truly, like, you're one of the very few that we've talked to so far that have this sixth sense, essentially, that can feel things, that can um, see things and understand things way past this realm. And it's amazing to have that ability because there are a lot of Roma that actually do have the same the same capabilities, oh, yes. very or very similar. And it's just, it's so funny when I, when I talk about this, we'll talk more about this a little bit later on, but it's just so funny when I hear Gudja discount the belief in other realms and, and the fact that there's things beyond our comprehension. It's very funny when I hear that. But speaking of other realms, um, I know you said you believe in vampires and werewolves, but I know in particular, you believe in ghosts. Is this true? Can you tell us more about that? Well, sure, I believe in ghosts. Um, well, not that they're scary always. They can be. Like when you have a bad dream. Like, you know, for instance, I had a couple of weeks ago, I had a very bad dream. And right by my bed, I had the St. Benedict's cross and my rosary. But I also had the miracle medal on me always. It was so scary, the dream. I grabbed it, the, say, the Benedict Medal on cross. I pinned it on me, and I put the rosary on it. Then three, four minutes, I fell back to sleep. It was gone, the dream. Now, my granddaughter, she went by medium, a psychic medium, and she told her, she said, you have another aunt. You've you got an aunt. She says, yeah, but she never knew. She said, oh, no, I don't. She said, yes, you do, and she's with your other and that passed away she's with your cousin she watches her okay and uh that was that was like really you know she told her things she didn't even know and like i was laying in bed with max and uh we both jumped up in the bed I had two German shepherds. This was after my father died, three, four days after. We got up, we looked at each other. He said, did you hear that? We both heard the same thing. We heard my father. It's, we went in the kitchen, and the dogs are in a circle, going around and around, and they're looking up, and then they're in a circle. We heard the same thing. I'm going to get you, girl. I'm going to get you, girl. That was my father's voice, and he, that's the words he would always tell the dogs. So he came back. I mean, I believe that the dead could come back and talk. And there's, I, I believe in all those things. Mm. That's something. And I know those are just a couple stories um, that you've mentioned so far that we added, that we didn't uh, talk about, but I know there were some stories you wanted to bring to the podcast. From um, Braddock in from the Bra yard. Yes, and all those things. So yeah, go. Do you, if you'd like to tell them now, go for it. All right, I'm going to try and be quick. For instance, my mother was a young little girl and this was in Braddock. And everybody mostly knows got school. Well, his father passed away and they had him laid out. Well, the the day they were going to bury him, they all went, you know, paid their respects. He sat up in a coffin 
everybody ran for their lives. They were running out of people. Well, he lived 10 years after that and had another baby. But he couldn't say nothing about it. He, he said he was on the other world, but he couldn't say nothing about it because if he would, you know, he would just die again. So what, what was that? They weren't embalming the people then. Many people were dying alive, they, you know. And then in Youngstown, my Baba Emma Dubo had a, uh, she was Romanian. She was her best girlfriend. She lived next door to her. And her father, he was a big symphony guy. He gave all the Roma men jobs. He was a big conductor. They had money. They were rich. And she never married. She was a young little girl, 16, 17. Well, her mother made her breakfast, bacon and eggs and all that. And she choked and she like fell like her head tied to the table. So her mother died. They were screaming right away. They, you know, they called the doctor and the they pronounced her dead. Well, they made a big funeral, big, big funeral. They dressed her in a big white, like a wedding dress with the diamonds in her neck and her ring and a bracelet. They put the tiara on her, all diamonds. They buried her. Well, our Roma boys went to dig her up, like in two, in a couple of days, the second day, like that. And they dug her up. They took the ring, the bracelet, the, the tiara, and they were trying to get the necklace off her neck. They were pulling it, you know. They didn't want to pick her up, so they were pulling it, pulling it. They, to break it, they pulled it. She went. <laughs> the baking came out of her. Came right on her went by the guy, by the kid. Yeah, I know. they ran from the cemetery. They were that scared. And she's saying, wait, wait. She crawled from the cemetery with the big gown in the mud or the mud. Way by her mother's house. Already she was so tired. She was on the, she had a big porch. She fell on the porch and she was like, she was calling her mother, mama, mama. But the mother thought, oh, that third day they come back to see you. They talk, right? When them days they had the milk, the butter, they would, the milkman would bring it. Well, when she opened the door, the mother, to get the milk, she seen the daughter there. She almost fainted. But the husband, she was screaming. Well, the daughter told her what happened. And they put a big reward and everything in a paper. But they never came. They never, you know, they were too scared. So they never came to to uh, get the reward or anything. They were just scared. But this girl lived all her life. And uh, she was my grandmother's friend. This is a very, very true story. Wow. So you mentioned something about the last story. I didn't mean to cut you off, but you mentioned something about the fact that they didn't embalm uh, the people back then. Where did they have funerals at? Well, they would put the, the few, some of them, they had funeral parties, but most of them were in the house. They did the coffin, the casket, and the house. Now, my great-grandfather, my grandmother, Emma Dubo, her father, his name was Dubo. Well, they had him in a French room. And I don't know, Pumbalo, Rudy Pumbalo was a baby. And my great-grandmother... Her name was Dubanya. She was beautiful. And he was very, very jealous of her. He told her, when I die, I don't want no party, no nothing. I don't want no food in the house. I don't want nothing. But she still did it. She, you know, she made everything. And the men were in the kitchen. They were playing cards. And she was holding the baby, Pumbalo, and she was rocking him. All the other kids were asleep. And she was by the cough and she was rocking him. Well, the baby fell out of her arms because his soul came out of the coffin and he was choking her to death. And the men came from the kitchen because the baby was crying long, you know, smits are thinking, well, why aren't you picking the baby up? What's wrong? So they went to see. And she was all twisted, her face, her arms, her arms, like if she... She was all bent, like a cerebral palsy. They said, yeah, well, what could happen to her, right? What? The baby and everything. So they called the funeral detect, the funeral man. And they told everybody to go in another room. They turned him over and they put a spike in the back of his neck. 
I thought he was a vampire, maybe. Who knows? No. But no, they said he had two souls. Now, I never heard of it, but a lot of people say, yeah, that, that a lot of people have two souls. So they took her three days in a high mass with the big candles at a church, 12 noon. And they were praying on her, praying on her. They said, if she doesn't turn back by the third day, she's going to die. But the first day, little bit, little bit, the second day she turned, turned it. By the third day, she was all turned back. Her body, her legs, her arms, she was regular. But she told them, you know, that it, that he, he did it. He was twisting her and all that, but she couldn't say anything else to them. Wow, that's something. And my Baba, that, that's my Baba. That's her father, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I didn't get a chance to ask you this before, but when the funeral director said two souls, what do you what did they mean by two souls? Do you know what they meant by that? I really don't know. The only thing I like two we we each have a soul. So he had an extra soul. So the one soul was still like uh well this soul when you your soul always lives, it goes to heaven. But Initially, it's dead. You understand? But you go to heaven and it's alive. So they had to put a spike through that. So maybe I said maybe he was he could have been a half vampire. I don't know. Hmm. Because I don't I don't know what that really meant in those days. I never really got a chance to think about that to look it up. But that's something I am going to do. I'm I'm going to look that up as well. uh, I'd like to know about it, you know. Huh. So it's funny you mentioned vampires. We were talking about Dracula earlier. Um, do you believe in vampires? Uh, in a sense, I do. I don't know that there is many now, but I believe back in the day there were. Mm. Uh because they were putting spikes in them. They couldn't look in the mirrors. Why would they make all these movies? And true people said that they were after them. They seen them. They, You know what I mean? It, it, it's sort of, in a way, I do believe in them. Do you? Well, I, I kind of have to because apparently everybody calls me one. So I guess that's <laughs> what I got to... I guess I must oh, believe I in myself. Oh, you want to have two souls? Stay away from you. <laughs> <laughs> no, forbid. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, 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 I mean. You it, just look like one. We all look oh, like no. the undead. We're pitch white with with very, like, dark hair. <laughs> yeah. But, um, no, I, I do. I will say this. I believe that there are it's not the way that that we think about it, like in movies or in right. books or there are spirits. There are people that there are, other, there are other beings. Yes, that can. Yeah, that prey upon people. And I I will say I don't want to necessarily give too much away uh, because I'm um this is a teaser to whoever whoever's listening to the podcast. I'm going to be doing an episode myself. So you guys get to hear all my scary stories. Um, and I have a bunch too. But uh, I've experienced things that I don't hope on anybody else. Because it's, and that's to prove the fact that I know that there are, again, it's not necessarily a vampire the way you would think it would be. But I've experienced some very interesting well, situations. Fact, let, let me just say something like this. Like this Jeffrey Dahmer. He could have been like a vampire. He was killing and eating the people. There you go. I mean, you know, a wolf man, he could have been. Something like that. You, you, there's, it's, I would just, he was sick. Yes, I believe that. But just because you're sick, that there's millions of sick people. But they don't do those things. So there was some kind of other being, I believe, inside of him. Speaking. 
speaking of very unhuman like creatures, can you tell us a story about the Shmerka or what we would believe to have been the Shmerka back in the day? Well, they say when you have a baby, you keep a knife in a comb under the bassinet, under the mattress, so it keeps them away. Why that? I don't know. But my son was a baby, maybe a couple months old. I, like at three months, I was going to baptize him. So my Baba great grandmother, Van Dvorka, which was my Baba Mimi's mother, I was laying on a couch and I had to bassin up because they say, don't turn. You never could turn yourself away from them till they're baptized. I don't know if you knew that. So I didn't turn. And I opened my eyes and I actually seen her trying to take my son out of the bassinet. And my grandmother, our family chose, when you see anything like that, you swear them, fuck, you get the fuck out of here, you seven of bitches, what do you want? You know, whatever you say. And she walked out into Babushka. Now, I grabbed my son, I was holding him, and he had the metal on him and stuff. And I looked through the Venetian blind, and I seen her walking in front of the house. And she was, you know, had her head down, how they walk, you're older. She had the babushka, and she looked through me with her. She pointed her finger. I could see it like today. She said, play one, two, three, and don't tell nobody. And she disappeared. So I played it on the lottery, and I didn't tell nobody. And I won all five tickets. They did, they did come out. But that, the next day I went to baptize him. You know, I was too scared. <laughs> I believe she came like a schmetka because she wanted to, they come to take the babies. That's what they do. And I, I believe in schmetka. <laughs> You were telling me a story about uh, a car, a black car. Could you tell me about oh, that? Sure. Give us all the details this on that. This was on New Year's Eve. Uh, this was a North Avenue, Burling North Avenue. In those days, the women went fishing. The explanation of fishing was getting the gajah, getting them drunk and everything, and he would give them money. He would give them money, and they would all share it. They would go fishing. It was 12 o'clock. It was raining real hard, and it was 12 o'clock. So they got a lift it was with a black car, like a, it looked like the good humor truck something. And there was, like, packages in a front seat, so they all went in the back. There was four women. My grandmother was one of them. I think it, the second one was, um, uh, what was her name? Hanka. I don't know the rest. Well, one looked to the front. They wanted to say, well, drop us off here, take us, you know. When they looked and they seen he had a black top hat on and his hands were like hoofs. They were hoofs from the bank. <clears throat> so she said in Gypsy, off bank, so got, got a old, old light, turns Lolo, thrust of the run out of the car. So they each took a hand of each other. On each side, they opened the doors and they jumped out of the car because the light turned red. They jumped out of the car and they got scratched up and everything and they, they all looked from side, both sides. The car went into the sewer. You know the sewer that had the lines in it? Not the round. The, long, the square sewers, they had the lines in them. Mm -hmm. The car went in there. Well, it would have took them in there. Where's the devil? Was in the car. Wow. That's something. That's yeah. truly something. And, I mean, I'm pretty sure. My Bubba said she never had a fear in her life, in her whole life like that. That fear. And in Braddock, there was a woman. I don't want to mention names. She was very mean. All the people in the yard, my grandfather owned the yard, they were very scared from her. She'd put a sheet on in the night and she'd run. And she'd scare the little kids. She'd run through the, through the 
It was like a cul-de-sac, you know? And they were all saying that she's a witch, right? They were calling her a witch because of what she does. So her husband was a blacksmith, or he would put the horseshoes on the horse. So one night he put the horseshoes, everything she was running, she made big problems in the yard. She was peeing on everybody, drawn to pee and running with that cheek. So he put the black shoots on the horse and he argued with her. You better stop what you're doing and all this. Rama, what's wrong with you? And while she went to sleep, got up in the morning, she had the shoe on her feet, the horseshoes from the horse. He didn't have them. And they were on her. Yeah. So they knew that she was the, the witch day. You know, I don't know what happened after that, but it, it, I think she disappeared or whatever happened. She died. Wow, that's something. Yeah. yeah. Now that's right. They used to call her. They used to call her basorka, right? That's that's the word. Right, mm -hmm. the basorka. Mm -hmm. Wow, these are some. These are some spooky stories, Phyllis. I gotta say, you but I gotta say the truth. There are true stories. These things really happen in life. People do not realize what happened. Many things happen. <laughs> I don't know if it's true. I don't know if you know if it's true. I wish I you do know. It's an old gypsy saying that when they put Delilo on a cross, his legs are together, right? And yeah. they put the one nail. His legs were supposed to be separate, that there was four nails. And one gypsy young boy stole a nail so that he don't have to go through that pain. Of having, did you ever hear that story? I did hear this story. And I don't know if it's true. I didn't, I read the Bible. I didn't see it in the Bible. But then again, they left out many stories in the Bible. I mean, you're talking you know? about, yeah, you're talking about, um, I mean, although the words are true, you're talking about a piece of work that's, now thousands of years old and during a time when language was still being formed in some ways. So okay. it makes sense. But I will say that I'm so glad that you agree with the fact that the Roma are, whether we like to believe it or not, that we are connected to these things. And that deep down, even though the stereotypes don't put us in the best of light, um, there are certain things about us that it's true. We are, we, we do just have a connection to the, to other things that most Gaja don't. you've been such a great guest on our show you've told such spooky stories and it's strange to believe that to know that somebody here has you you've heard this firsthand from people or you've experienced these things yourself and it's so hard to deny the fact that whether we like it or not the Roma live this sort of very otherworldly existence at times but I have one more question for you if you had to leave our Roma with words of wisdom or advice, what would be something you would like our Roma to know? What would be your message to them? What I wish for the Roma, that they should be like they were years ago. They should love and respect and help each other. Be for one another like the Jewish people are. That, 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 everyone. The kids should be with their parents, with their grandparents, help them, help strangers that need things, give, love, 
it's it's the best thing. Shut your mouth, lower it, forgive, forget. If, when you forgive, that's the only way you're going to get to heaven because God forgave us. So oh, we can't even enter the kingdom of heaven if we don't, you know? And the main thing is just to be, I wish it would be like the old times. That's how I wish it would be. Everybody's door is open. They're welcome. Nobody argues. Nobody fights. It's, it's just peace and love one another. If someone tells you something, ignore it. Maybe they had a bad day. You know? If a waitress is not that great to you, okay, maybe she got something on her mind or so she's so busy. So what? Let it go. That that's what I got to say. Love one another. Try to. All right then. Well, Phyllis, again, it was nothing but a pleasure having you a uh, part of Overda Darano and telling us these wonderful stories and giving us these words of wisdom. We usually close this out with one little statement. Um, Raquel, you go ahead for it. Gia kor mangav tuke baktalotrom preko tunyaripe. Till then, I wish you safe travels through the darkness. This broadcast of Oberda Darano was brought to you by the talents of Pierce and Raquel Horvath, creators of Dead Scared Entertainment, with the help of Piroz Garaj. You've been listening to a production from Dead Scared Entertainment, where terror is our tradition. Good night.